You can have a seat. Uh, out of curiosity, how many of you uh, speak Spanish as your native language, your heart language? Yeah. Uh, Hey, we'll get to it a little bit later on, but uh, we had asked Aura to come and pray. One, because she leads our prayer time Saturday mornings with some of the other ladies. Uh, but also, the vision of the kingdom of God is a multi-ethnic, multi-racial kingdom. Um, and we want to be a people here in Bakersfield that reflect the city that we've been called to. Uh, and we are a multiracial, multi-ethnic city. Uh, and so as we lean into that, that was our desire, is to have that be a reflection. Uh, this morning, uh, we are going to be in Jeremiah chapter 29. If you need a Bible, our frontline team will get you one. Uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, they will make sure to pass one to you. If you do not have a Bible at home, maybe it's not just that you didn't bring it with you, but you don't have one. Uh, you can feel free to take that one that you're asking for. That is our gift to you. Um, we're going to be closing out our Citizens of Heaven series today. Uh, and, we've, and I want to just kind of map out where we've been through this series. Week one, we had uh, Pastor Nate talk about citizenship, that we are in an already but not yet kingdom, that the kingdom of God has already come and is established but is not yet complete, and that has implications for us here and now. Uh, Pastor Jeff then taught through alien living, what does it look to ha have an unwavering faith and allegiance to King Jesus in a world of compromise? What does it look like to make sure that your allegiance is to Jesus uh, and not to anything in the world? Uh, and then Pastor DJ taught on being ambassador that we are uh, God's ambassadors, people living in a foreign place representing a different kingdom with a ministry of reconciliation, that we are calling a, a, a lost and broken world to ourselves. And, and then last week, Pastor Jeff touched on what's our ultimate allegiance. What do we see as the solution and the answer in the world? Uh, we talked a little bit about politics, that those can be part of God's plan for the world, but that cannot be our ultimate hope and place of trust. And then this morning, what we're going to be looking at in Jeremiah chapter 29 is this idea of what does it look like to follow the command to seek for the welfare of the city you've been placed in? What does it look like to value and love the city that you've been placed in? Uh, we've been giving this definition of citizen of heaven as one who gives full allegiance to King Jesus, enjoying the rights and responsibilities of God's kingdom while temporarily living in this world. That's what we've been wrestling with. What does it look like to live as a citizen in full submission to King Jesus in a world that offers us so many other places to put our faith and trust? And so I want to maybe uh, paint three different ways I think we have often in the Western American church looked at the kingdom of God versus the earth. And I want to just see if you can locate yourself in one of these three kind of worldviews. Uh, number one is that we are living for a future kingdom, right? Uh, back in the 90s, the not of this world stickers that were all over the place, right? And it was this sentiment, this idea that like, yes, I'm here, but like I'm not really here because my ultimate, you know, uh, residence is in heaven. And it was this subtle idea that it made what was happening here not really matter. Right, that uh, there's a quote that they were so heavenly minded they were of no earthly good. Right, that your your view and your vision for God's kingdom is all future. Man, I just I can't wait to get to heaven. That is your one and sole goal. And while there's nothing wrong with a desire to be united with God in heaven, if it is at the sacrifice of what is happening here and now, then I think we've missed part of our call as kingdom people. Number two is to fight the world, uh, for the world to value and look like the kingdom, right? This is the cultural Christian warrior, that every law that comes up, everything that comes up that does not look like a kingdom value, you feel this deep burden to fight that and make sure that it goes back to whatever vision you have of what kingdom law should look like. And again, I want to say there's nothing wrong with being in opposition to ungodly laws, and yet it, it's amplified to a 12, right? That everything that does not look like the kingdom, you feel a burden as though it is your responsibility to turn that ship and to ride it around. Or maybe the last one is that you create a separate culture of kingdom, right? You really withdraw from culture altogether. Um, you know, have you ever heard the genre Christian music? Okay. Or Christian literature, or Christian movies, right? We, we see of like, well, I can't touch this ungodly earthly category, and so I'm just going to create my own subculture. 
I'm going to create my own separate culture, my separate kingdom where we can kind of live and operate under a different bounds and never the two shall meet. In fact, I, I, I can't even go and see a normal movie because it's a secular movie. I can only watch Christian movies. And we remove ourselves as though that will communicate to the world the value of the kingdom of God. And so in Jeremiah chapter 29, where we're going to be this morning, uh, I think God actually gives a very different compelling vision of what it means to be a citizen of heaven in the here and now. Uh, as you turn there, we're going to be starting in verse 4 of Jeremiah 29. A little context. Um, this is the kingdom of Judah, which was the southern kingdom in Israel. At that time, there were two different kingdoms that were in the nation of Israel. The southern kingdom was where Jerusalem was. Uh, in uh, 586 BC, um, Babylon comes in and takes over uh, Jerusalem, takes over the southern kingdom, conquers them, drags off their leaders, their priests, the, the best of the best, drags them off into captivity in Babylon, leaving only destruction left in the southern kingdom. The temple is destroyed. Jerusalem is destroyed. Uh, it is in ruins. And Jeremiah is a prophet that was right before that happens. He's been telling Israel, turn back to God. Turn back to God. It's not going to go well with you. Turn back to God. And in Jeremiah chapter 29, he finally says, you're not turning back to God. And so I'm going to give you an image of what it is that is coming. And so we're going to start in 29 verse 4. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. And there's, I'm going to highlight four encouragements through this passage. Encouragement number one, here and now matters, so live and flourish is God's response to his people. He is sending them into a polytheistic, uh, completely pagan culture. He is sending them into, and once that's what they probably would have considered the heart of darkness in, in their world. He's sending them into exile. They are going to be slaves and oppressed. And his message to them is not, wait for your moment. Okay, lull them into complacency. Be good citizens until I tell you to, and then rise up against them and take them down, right? No, his encouragement to them is actually, hey, on your way into captivity, don't wait around for deliverance. Become part of this culture. Build your house, plant a garden. Marry off your kids. He is giving a generational view that they need to go into captivity, not with a view of how quickly can I escape, but one of how do I live as a person of God in a place of captivity? How do I live in a life of flourishing in a place of captivity? Live and flourish. This is uh, in direct opposition to that idea of Gnosticism, that somehow the, the physical world and the spiritual world are like separate, and the physical world is terrible, and the spiritual world is all that we should care about. Instead, he's saying, no, no, no. Normal life is good life, right? God created the world. He created people, and in it, he created an idea of what human flourishing looks like. Right? He didn't create human beings just for heaven. He created human beings for a perfect union with him in his creation. And so God is basically envisioning, as you head off to be slaves, would you have such a potent view of your love for me that you can embed yourself in the culture, you can live a life of flourishing within Babylon, within the heart of darkness, we're going to skip the verses, but right after that, he actually also warns to be careful because there are going to be prophets, other prophets that come in Babylon that go, hey, you don't have to wait the full time. God's going to deliver you early. Pack up your stuff. Be ready to go. And he says, look, they are, they are lying to you. You're in for 70 years, so dig in. Flourish where I have put you. Did you notice that? And he says, whom I have sent into exile. God is making it very clear. This story was not orchestrated by Babylon. This story was orchestrated by God. He says, I am placing you in this captivity. I am sending you into exile. So because it's me that's doing it, I have a plan for this. 
And the plan begins with living and flourishing. Uh, number two, it, the second encouragement is here now matters because we're supposed to resist earthly assimilation, right? We're supposed to resist earthly assimilation. Babylon's tactics was cultural assimilation, right? They took the best of the best. They brought them into the palace. Those that would submit, they indoctrinated, literally indoctrinated, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had a, a MDiv in polytheistic theology. They had an MDiv in, astro in astrology. They, they had gotten trained up in the cultural narrative of Babylon, and yet they did not adopt the cultural narrative of Babylon. Daniel said, I'll learn your customs, but I won't adopt them. I'm not afraid of your cultural information because of my robust spiritual formation. Can I say that again? I'm not afraid of your cultural information because I have a stronger spiritual formation that is at my core. These men were, were grown up in Israel under King Josiah, a child king who did not have the law. He did not have the law, but he went and out of a love for God, tore down the high places. And then he finds the law of all places in the temple. He's like, well, I didn't know this was here. And he aligns the entire nation of Israel back to the heart of God. He went to radical lengths to root out the idolatry of the people of God. It would have been out of that heritage that these men said, I have no fear of your paganism because I serve and honor God. 1 Peter 2, verse 11 through 12, Pastor Jeff taught on this last week, says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of, visit of visitation. Look, you have a cultural force that is trying to shape you into the earth's perspective and lens of humanity. The earth has its own idea of what human flourishing looks like that has nothing to do with God, right? The world, the flesh, and the devil is at war against you to try and deform you away of, from the image of God. And Peter's saying, like, wage war against that. Press back against that. Do you know how you do it? You live such good lives, that even when they accuse you of things that are absolutely false, the world will see your good do deeds and glorify God. I have friends who are in the, the school district, in the teaching world, and uh, this is not a new debate, but it's one that I've been in for a long time. Uh, just for context, I was homeschooled, private schooled, independent studied, public schooled, community college, private college, and state school. So, if anyone gets to talk about all the different ways that you could be indoctrinated by the culture, it's me. Whether it was by my own family or by the world, right? There was indoctrination happening. And I hear people all the time, I can't send my kids in there. I can't send my kids in there. They, they don't have what they need to withstand all that the world has to show them and tell them they are going to be brainwashed into believing things that are not true. Um, I woke up at 2.20 this morning, and the Lord uh, had a word for me. Uh, I was just sitting in prayer, and to be totally honest, this part of my sermon had very little. Uh, it just, it, it, there was like this big blank. I don't know, if, for those of you that ever teach, it was like there was just writer's block there. And I woke up at 2.20 this morning, and the Lord's like, hey, there's something that needs to be heard this morning. And so I don't know who needs to hear it, but here's what he said to me. Some of you need to hear, the only reason you would need to be truly fearful for your kids in the school system or the world at large is if the spiritual formation in your home is less potent than the cultural narrative. Should I say that one again? The only reason you need to be truly fearful for your kids in the school system or the world at large is if the spiritual for formation in your home is less potent than the cultural narrative. I am not unaware of the cultural narrative that is at work in the world. I, I am not blind to it. I am aware. I see it all over. Th there, are, there are algorithms that are trying to shape you in total like unawareness to your own consciousness. 
I, I know this. However, that's why there's such a deep conviction in our heart that we should be centering our families on Jesus and living out the gospel. That we should be so convinced that we need to be pursuing the ways of Jesus. That our counter formation to the world needs to be more potent than the world's formation. It's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He had a friend that came and was like trying to deter him away from his radical pursuit of Jesus. And he marched him over to where the Nazis were training. And he said, our spiritual formation has to be stronger than that formation. That is the way of Jesus, is a counter formation to the way of the world. Daniel and his friends, like I said, got an MDiv in polytheism, paganism, astrology, and divination and still went to the furnace for their faith for the one true God. And then Jeremiah goes on, verse seven. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Encouragement number three, here and now matters. Sacrificially love the world and pray for it sacrificially love the world and pray for it. That word welfare is, is a very unique word. Some of you have probably heard it before in, in Jewish language. It's the word shalom. It's peace and prosperity. So if you read that back into it, it says, but seek the peace and prosperity of the city where, again, I have sent you. Hear that. It's God that's behind this. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its peace and prosperity, you will find your peace and prosperity. Shalom is this idea that there's this wholeness, completeness, health, safety, harmony, prosperity, biblical peace between both God and people. This is the image of the garden from the beginning, that people walked in unity with one another and with God. This is shalom. And God is saying to the people of Israel, don't go wage war against the culture. He says, go pray that they would find the peace of God that they would find shalom you want to know the, one of the only times that there's a command in all of scripture to pray for peace like that it's actually in Psalm 122 verses 6 through 9 it says pray for the peace of Jerusalem some of you have probably been quoting this passage lately Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. This would have been in the, in the minds of the people hearing Jeremiah. That would have been one of the most radical controversial commands that God could have given the people as they headed into Babylon. They would have had their cultural memory. We should have the peace of God, the shalom, the absolute wholeness, completeness of God's vision for the world. I pray that over God's central place of holiness at that time, which is Jerusalem. And God's saying, I'm sending you into a new place, but you don't need to be praying for peace and shalom in Jerusalem. You need to be praying for peace and shalom in the place that I am sending you. peace and prosperity. How many of you guys, that's your answer to the cultural things that you rage against in your heart? <laughs> right? You hear about some unjust law that you're against, and your first response is to go like, man, I want peace and prosperity for them. Uh, I had a moment, uh, I was over in Avila Beach, you know, Bakersfield of the West, um, and I was at a coffee shop, and uh, I'm not gonna tell what politician because I don't want to tip either direction. I want you to see yourself in the story, okay? A, a well-known national figure who is not a Californian walked in to the coffee shop and they had just done something that from my opinion was pretty stupid, politically speaking. And I sat up in above the coffee shop and I just watched and I sat there and I, I texted Ellie because I was by myself and I was like, what do I do? Do I go tell him how wrong he is? She's like, maybe you should pray for him. It's like, that's not it. <laughs> and, and, and here's what I'll, I'll confess, like from the stage. I, I didn't pray for him. I didn't go up and pray for him. I didn't pray for him, period. You know why? Because my prayer would have been at a best passive aggressive, at worst full on aggressive. I would have been 
like through a parable of prayer, hoping that he would get the message of what I thought he should really be doing. God's invitation to his people is to love the place, the broken, sinful, earthly place he has sent them with such a deep conviction that they want God's peace and reconciliation, his wholeness, his relationship, his presence to descend upon them, whether they want it or not. And that should drive us to a deep conviction of prayer. We talk about we don't just want to pray, we want to be a people of prayer. Let me tell you, praying for your enemies is probably the most Christian thing you could do and the hardest thing you could do. Praying for the people you consider rivals is one of the most Jesus-like things that you could do. And yet it is one of the most challenging. And here is Jeremiah speaking on behalf of God saying, the thing I want you to do as you head into the heart of darkness is to pray for the welfare the shalom, the peace of the place that you are going. In uh, Matthew 6.10, when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is an invitation for God's rule and reign to happen now as though there was no opposition, right? It's inviting the shalom, the peace of God, to rule and reign in the place that you are. So what would the kingdom of God, God's will on earth as it is in heaven, look like today? What did that look like with flesh on in the early church? An author, Larry Hurtado, wrote a book called Destroyer of the Gods, and it sought to explain why an increasing number of people converted to Christianity in the Roman world, right? Babylon was terrible. Rome was terrible. So why did people come to faith in such a place like that? And this was what Hurtado said was the unique Christian, what he called social project. It was five biblical convictions that Christians held to that radically confronted the world they lived in. Number one was a multiracial, multi-ethnic kingdom. That it was no longer marked by the place that I was born into. It was no longer marked by the people that were like me. It was marked by a unity around our differences under the banner of Jesus Christ. Previously, people were born into their religion. Their race determined their faith. But now God said, you get to choose your faith and you get to choose my son, Jesus. Number two, they were highly committed to caring for the poor and the marginalized. It was normal in that time, in a high honor culture, for people to honor their own families, to honor their own people, to honor their own nation. And here come the Christians who are showing radical generosity and honor for the marginalized and the poor, regardless of whose poor they were, regardless of whose marginalized they were. The church said they will be receiving the blessing of the kingdom. Emperor Julian, who was a terrible emperor in Rome, said the radical Christian practice of caring not only for their own poor, but for ours as well, was both offensive and attractive. The third one was non-retaliatory, mar- non-retaliatory marked by a commitment to forgiveness. Rome was dragging people into coliseums for them to be torn to pieces by animals, and the Christians were praying for the people watching them as they died. I still don't think we have a category for a kingdom of God that looks like that. Love of enemy, a community of peacemaking, reconciliation, and bridge building. Number four, strongly and practically against abortion and infanticide. There was again this idea that if a child was born and there was a blemish, there was something that was wrong, there was such a a value of perfection in the Roman world that they would take them out into outskirts of the city, out into forests, and just leave them there to die. And the Christians would go out to the forest and say, I'll take that baby. I will raise that baby as my own. Christ Jesus has adopted me. I am adopting them. The church so radically loved the marginalized and, and those unwanted that it compelled an entire empire. And then fifthly, a revolutionary, it was revolutionary regarding the ethics of sex. That the traditional Christian sex ethic, sex no longer was simply self-gratification, for, but for giving one's whole life in a consensual marriage covenant. This was absolutely in opposition to Rome. And 
all five were these biblical tenets that the early church held tightly to to say, this is what living and flourishing in humanity under God's kingdom looks like under the empire. Pastor Timothy Keller says this about this work by Larry Hurtado. Said the early Christian community was both offensive and also attractive. Believers did not construct their social project in some strategic way to reach Roman culture. Each of the five elements was there because Christians sought to submit to biblical authority. They are all commanded. They are just as category defined, both offensive and attractive today. The first two views, ethnic diversity and caring for the poor, sound liberal in our minds. And the last two sounds uh, uh, conservative. But the third element, of course, sounds like no particular party. Churches today are under enormous pressure to jettison the first two or the last two, but to not keep them all. Yet to give up any of them would make Christianity the handmaid of a particular political program and undermine a missionary encounter. We can live compelling lives as citizens of heaven in a world that wants nothing to do with the way of God. And by so doing, like it says in 1 Peter, make such a compelling view of God in the kingdom that they glorify God when they see your good works. And then quickly, lastly, Jeremiah 29, 10 through 11 says this, and this is the part that we know from Jeremiah 29, 11. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for shalom, for peace and prosperity and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Last encouragement, here and now matters because eternity matters. God will fulfill his promises. God is going to redeem all things. Yes, we live here and now and we are supposed to live as robust, flourishing members of God's kingdom in the here and now, but we are supposed to live in such a way that those that encounter us get to experience an eternity with Jesus. This is the only opportunity you have Right? This is the only opportunity that you have to be a witness to people who are lost and enemies of God. Because when Jesus returns to redeem all things, that choice is no longer available. And so he says, look, you don't have to worry about the next 70 years. You just need to know I am coming back and I will fulfill my promises. And I think we, church, need to be reminded that God is coming back and will fulfill his promises. So ultimately, all of our faith and trust needs to be in what he's doing. And in the meantime, we need to live such obedient lives that it draws people to him. So what? What are we supposed to take away from this? I came up with four, but as always, if God's stirring something else in you, uh, write that down. That's what I want you to remember. Uh, Number one, as a resident alien in this world, an exile, we're called to live and flourish in this world, not just the world to come. We are meant to live the kingdom of God here and now in a broken world. So compelled and potent in the kingdom of God that we are not just future looking to the kingdom, but recognizing our life with Christ has already started. It doesn't start in eternity. Our life with Christ has already started. It doesn't just start in eternity. Number two, we're called to resist the ways of the world and live as citizens of heaven. And this resistance is a peaceful resistance. This resistance is still a radical resistance, but it is a peaceful resistance. Where in this passage does God say, take your sword with you, wait for my call, we'll get them when you're not expecting it? No, he says, the way to overthrow a wicked earth is actually the way of love the way of God's love, the way of God's peace. Number three, we're called to love the world and pray for its peace and prosperity. Where's your heart in praying for the peace of the city that you're in? What's the level of conviction that you would pray and intercede to God on behalf of the people around you? And then lastly, we're called to live in such a way as to draw others to eternal peace with God. This ties right back into our mission as ambassadors. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation that those who are enemies with God can be made at peace with God and not just at peace with God, adopted children, part of the family. So for now, what today, what do I do with this? I I came up with four questions because I want you to wrestle with the Lord on what the application is. But these are just four questions I think should stir us to a place of obedience. Number one, are you flourishing or waiting for the clock to run out? 
right? As you look at the lenses that maybe you walked into today with, are you flourishing in the kingdom of God or are you simply waiting for the clock to run out? Are you listening to the, in one sense, the false prophet language that goes, don't worry guys, 2025, that's the year that God's gonna come back. So don't worry about investing, spend all your money right now. You can't take it with you. Or are we actually having a generational view of living in the kingdom? Number two, are you resisting the world's formation? Are you pursuing kingdom counterformation, spiritual formation? Are you just wholesale accepting the messages of the, this world as though they're real and then just sprinkling, sprinkling a little bit of God's truth here and there and mixing it in together like it's all supposed to exist together? These convictions were birthed out of a submission to the truth of God's word. Do you have a compelling kingdom social vision? Would your neighbors say that you do such good work that they glorify God when they watch you? Does your boss see you do such good work that he glorifies God on your behalf because of how you live? Do the people that you hire to do work for you see your good work and the way that you treat them such a compelling vision of the kingdom that they glorify God because of you? And then finally, do you have a heart for the world, but a vision for eternity, right? Is your heart stirred to love this world that has fallen and broken and apart from God and out of a, a vision for eternity in separation with God that you finally have come to a place where you go, I need to love this world into the arms of Jesus. Because Jesus is our image. Jesus is our example. If you came in today, you got a communion cup. And if, if you're new to church, maybe you don't know what this is. Communion is something that we do once a month in our church context to remember what Jesus did on our behalf. It's simply a symbol of the new covenant in the kingdom of God, this new relationship we have with God. And the symbols are twofold. Number one, that the, the cracker is meant to be a representation of Christ's body, which was broken on our, our behalf on the cross that he paid the penalty for your sin so you don't have to be enemies anymore, but be a child of God. And the juice is simply a representation of the blood of Christ. That, that blood that he shed on your behalf is what paved the way to be in right relationship with God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 26, Paul says this, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Brothers and sisters, as we go into one more song of worship, the invitation would be to take communion at your own pace. To maybe sit with some of those questions of reflection and allow God to stir in your heart, but to have a vision of Jesus as the one that you're holding tightly to. And then as the Lord leads in worship to respond, first with the bread and then with the juice, to remember what Christ did on our behalf so that we could be citizens of heaven. Would you just bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you're a good God who loves us, that you loved us enough that you sent your son Jesus. Lord, that you established your kingdom so we could be kingdom people in the here and now, that it's not just a life in eternity to come that we're pursuing, it's a life of eternity starting now in relationship with you under ultimately your authority. So God, would you be honored in our worship? It's in Jesus' name that we pray.